Stevie, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you fine. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah. Everything's okay. Yeah, I've been so long, and I was pressing all kinds of buttons there, but hopefully it'll work fine. I, I got it I got it set up, so it should be okay. How are you doing? Not bad. How's everything going today? Yeah, yeah, not too bad. Not too bad, thanks. Good. Uh, tell me a little bit uh, um, about uh, the new album, uh, Stevie James and Phil uh, Wilkins. Uh, yeah, well, we got together. Obviously, we've worked together before in the past in Crash KO. Some people would know about it, some people wouldn't. Uh, we've been talking about doing something, and Living Without You came up, because I recorded it for, um, well, it was basically going to be a bonus track on My Private Hell. It was an acoustic version, blah, blah, blah. And uh, we never ended up using it. We didn't we didn't put it on the album, so it was just floating around for years, which I obviously I'd done with Chris Laney and uh, Anders Ringman, you know. Right. So uh, I had that demo here floating around for a long, long time, and Phil came over one day. I hadn't seen him for, for many years. And he came over and I played it to him. And he said, well, let's do something with it, you know. And I said, well, you know, I, I haven't got uh, I haven't got this, I haven't got that. I need to get in the studio. And he said, well, right, well, I'll book the studio. We'll go in. We went in the studio and worked with a, a great producer called Dave Draper, who's just, just done the new Professionals album. And uh, he's also, he also works a lot with Ginger Wild Art. So, you know, he's got uh, a good track yeah. record. Um, and, and basically what happened was we went in and did Living Without You. I don't know if you've heard that version. But uh, we went in and did it, and it came out so well that uh, we started talking about, you know, doing this this Time Machine record, you know. Right. And the guy at the, guy at the label I'd been talking to, his name's Paul, who, who runs AOR Boulevard Records. I've been talking to him for a long, long time about doing an album. And um, when I mentioned the covers album, everybody's the same. They're like, mm, not sure, you know. It's a, people think it's a cop out, all the rest of it. But obviously, we went ahead, we chose the songs. I mean, I, I don't think I sent you the sleeve notes, did I? But it explains everything on there about the songs and the process of everything else. We chose so many songs. And in the end, we wanted to go for stuff that was quite known, sometimes well known, but stuff that meant a lot to us growing up through the years when we started buying records, you know? Right, yeah. And that's how the process started. A absolutely you know, we, we started it from zero and just build it up. Uh, tell me, tell me a little bit about, um, you know, uh, the time with Tiger Tales until now. Uh, I mean, um, I mean, going in the studio and, and just the music itself uh, is a, a complete turnaround, basically, from, uh, you know, back in the glam days compared to now. Um, is, is working in the studio a lot different? Um, yeah, yeah, I found it a lot. I mean, when I was in Tiger Tales, as you know, I only done one EP and, and obviously Young and Crazy. And to be honest, Young and Crazy was done so fast. I mean, I don't know what the budget was for it, but it ended up costing about six grand, I think, in total. And it was done so fast. The vocals were, were done over a couple of days. It, it was just, it was a strange process because we had to do it, get in there and do it. And how can I explain it? It was it was difficult, you know. The first mixes we got of, of the record, because we'd done the EP, the Shoot to Kill EP, which was done in Wales uh, by a different producer, and it sounded so... It captured everything about us, you know. It, it sounded raw. The songs, I, I thought the three songs on there were great, and it springboarded us to where we went. And when we went... when we went, Because we we'd already recorded the album. It wasn't called Young and Crazy, but we'd recorded the album uh, on the back of that with... Uh, the manager from Tokyo Blade was overseeing all that. That was a connection I got from auditioning with Tokyo Blade. And uh, we used Steve Pierce, their drummer, on the EP before Ace came into, into the band. So we basically went in and recorded that album, which would have been or did, did turn out to be young and crazy. But uh, the production on that first one was really, really good. But the songs were different. I don't know if you've ever heard that, that original Sin album and, and the stuff, but it was a much... I, I thought it was a better produced record, but it had different songs on it. So when it comes to signing with Music for Nations, because we played out, you know, we were getting a huge following over here. We were in Kerrang and stuff. We were probably, well, we definitely were the only unsigned band that played two nights, you know, one after the other at the Marquee in London, the old Marquee. <laughs> and we got signed off the back of that, basically. So they threw us in the studio straight away with the old, basically the old songs we had, but we just, we re-recorded a lot of the stuff, you know. Right, yeah. I did. I redid all the vocals, and I did it in. You know, I'm not David Coverdale. You know <laughs> what I mean? And I did it 
so fast. It was like, well, we just had to, you know, we had to deal with it. We came out of there with the mixes and they, were, they weren't very good. So we went back in and tried to fix some of the stuff. But in hindsight now, it, all right, when it came out, it didn't sound like a million dollar production. But I think it's lasted the test of time because it still sounds raw. It's, I, kind of, I kind of equate it to the Motley Crue Too Fast for Love original leather records when it's really raw. Right, no yeah. pop, no nothing, you know. And yeah, that was that was tough. That was tough going in and doing that. But we were, you know, we were kids. We right. were kids. We didn't know any better. And and basically, we got signed, and that's the way we did it, you know. Right. Yeah. Wow. And roll roll on to the time post Tiger Tales for me. After I'd gone, they obviously went in with a huge budget and did their next album. And uh, I got signed by Carlin Music, which is uh, a publishing company in London. They've done. Oh God, they've done everybody in the 50s and 60s up till they're still, do, still doing it now. A massive company. Right. And they put right. me they put me in the studio to do a three track EP, which was the Kick That Habit EP. And they gave me seven grand to do it. Right. You know right. what I mean? It was like doing an album but three songs. And we had Scott Gorham producing it, and it was a different experience. And we got time to to look at things, you know, and time time to get a, a grip on what was going on. So I think I mean that production. That sounds pretty good even today, you know. Right, yeah. That was right, a, yeah. that was the difference between those two albums. You, you know, we we had a, a full album, which was done in two minutes. I had a three-track EP, which was done over nearly a week. It was just bizarre, you know. Right. And that's that's how I, you know, that that's how I started off with that. And um, you know, fast forward to my private hell, that was the best record. That was the most enjoyable record I ever did, because I, I went over with uh, Chris Laney and Anders. Ringman over to Platform Studios in Sweden and you know we'd worked on the songs via the internet before that and uh, I was loving everything I mean Lang is a genius in my eyes anyway and uh, I was loving everything they were sending me over so I went over there and uh, the first demos that we did the four tracks actually ended up not quite the same but almost the same they ended up on the album which was amazing I think it was Kiss of Death and Oh, I can't remember the other two. There was Kick It Down was the other one. There was another song, but it was four tracks, basically, because we were demoing, you know. Right, yeah. It went so well that we carried on. We carried on. I went over there and uh, and started writing together. I think the last song, one of the last songs we did was probably My Private Hell, the actual title track. But, you know, I, I wrote with them. And when I was in the studio, it was like, it was like chalk and cheese to Tiger Tales. I had... I had you know, I was in the studio mainly with Anders, but Chris was there often as well. And they were actually going, you know, we were going through things, warming up, warming down, stuff like I'd never done before. And it really, really helped me, you know. And I, I just got a lot of confidence from, from speaking those, to those two guys and the way they worked. And I think that's, you know, that's reflected in that record, if I'm honest. Right, right. Now, uh, when you go out and play live, how, how much difference is it from, uh, you know, back in the day to uh, today's uh, audiences? Oh man, it's it's yeah, it's totally different. It's tough out there now for anybody. <laughs> any any up and comings will, will tell you the same thing. I mean, when when I was in Tiger Towers, we we used to get in a van, we drive from from Wales to Carlisle, which is nearly Scotland, to play to two people, you know. Right. But we would keep on banging it, banging it, banging it, and going up and down the motorways. And in the end, you know, these two people were turning into two hundred, you know, and 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 on and on until we could sell out these venues. Nowadays, you can't do that kind of thing, you know. There just isn't the, you know, live music's not like it was, you know yourself, unless you're a big band. I mean, even big bands, sometimes, you know, they have trouble selling out these big venues, you know. Right. So, yeah, that's that's the way it is. Do you, do you feel uh, that's why a, a lot of bands don't even tour no more? They they call it a project, this way they just do the studio album and, and don't tour? Well, I, I, excuse me one second, Brian, one yeah. second. Okay. My dog's bowl empty, I'll have to give him some water. Sorry. Sorry, mate, sorry. No problem, no problem. Yeah. I, got, I got two dogs. Yeah, I mean, he's, he's looking at me and his bowl's empty, you know, and he's like, <laughs> Jesus Christ. Uh, yeah, getting back to touring bands, um, it's, yeah, it's tough. I mean, even, you know, unless you're in, you know, the, the big league, like Lady Gaga and all those, Adele and all that, I think a lot of them find it tough. And, and, I read uh, a little while ago that Def Leppard just aren't going to put albums out anymore. Just going to put EPs and stuff out, you know. It's really well, you know yourself. It's changed so much. 
you know, with obviously with the invention of the internet and social media, just things are just, you know, like it or not, things things have changed a hell of a lot. Record companies don't have the, you know, they don't have the same clout as they used to, and and people can make a record right. on a on a computer, you know. Right. So, yeah, I think uh, touring wise, yeah, it, it's really tough, man. And I'm I'm not getting any younger, you know what I mean? So. I couldn't go out there and hit those clubs like that, even if even if I wanted to, you know. Right. Yeah, I know. I mean, uh, uh, I get between three and five hundred emails a day uh, of bands trying to, you know, send me their demos and stuff like that. So I can yeah. just imagine, you know, trying to even make it, you know, in the music industry anymore. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I feel sorry for some of them, you know, because there's some good bands about, but I I don't know I don't know how they I don't know how they go about it anymore. You know what I mean? I I, I really don't know, and uh, it's just, I, I think a lot of them just go and do it themselves, so it, it's, it's easier to self-finance everything, obviously, now, anyway. Right, and but play, play, Sorry, go John. Go ahead. No, playing live, I mean, for these new bands, you know, whether they have to buy on, or whether they do their own shows and that, it must be, it must be tough, you know. Tribute bands, on the other end, sell out everywhere they play, which is a bizarre, it's a bizarre thing, you know. Do you, do you feel that that's why a lot of these bands from the '80s are are, are uh, making a comeback now? Well, there's a resurrection, like you were saying about Frontiers. Yeah. They seem to they seem to be signing every American band again. Spread Eagle just got signed, didn't right, they? Right. Yeah. Yes. I mean, I was I was really surprised that Pretty Boy Floyd got signed, but fair play to them, you know. It just seems like Frontiers are, are the go-to label for the the old '80s bands. Right. Yeah. Well, I, I heard the Pretty Boy Floyd. Uh, a disc already, already in it's so so, you know. Yeah, I, I've not. I've only heard one song. Of, I forget that had a video to go with it as well. Right. And the, the thing that surprised me the most is they're not getting sued by Iron Maiden for the logo. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, but uh, Spread Eagle should be uh, pretty good. I think. Yeah. Uh, they're personal. Yeah, no, no, no. Go ahead. Go on. Sorry. No. So you carry on, mate. I, I'm just saying they're personal friends of mine. I I went in the studio with them when they recorded. Uh, their second album and did some press photos for them and stuff like that. And they're still today. They're, they're great friends of mine. And, uh, you know, I wish them the best. And, uh, I'm pretty sure they're going to put out a, a killer product. I yeah. would have thought, yeah. I mean, they've got a lot of respect as well. Haven't they? A lot of people do like them. Right. I see people, I see people talking about them on forums and stuff and they, 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 really, yeah, they just seem to, they just seem to respect them and, uh, and like a lot of their music, you know? So with you, what are your plans, you know, looking ahead for uh, Stevie James? Um, well, at the moment, we're going to we're concentrating on doing another solo record because that one, it was a total one off, you know, that that time machine. It was something we wanted to do. It's something we talked about for a long time. And, uh, you know, in hindsight, I think it came out pretty well. And it, it's, you know, the only trouble with that album was it's a covers record. And as soon as people see that covers name, right. they think, here we go, it's a, it's a cop out, it's generic. And if you give that album a chance, it, it's, you know, I think we've done a good job on it. And the production's great as well. So, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm hopefully going back in the studio with the same producer and we're going to we're going to do another solo record of uh, obviously original stuff, you know, put it out and see, see how we get on. Right. You, you said you work with Chris Laney. Yeah, yeah, I did. The, my Private Hell was was produced by Chris Laney and Anders Ringman in in Stockholm. Yeah. Right. Yeah, because Chris is a, another personal friend of mine, and uh, that guy knows his stuff. He's an amazing person, and uh, you know I love him dearly. He's a, he's a great guy. He's a great friend of mine. He came over and stayed with me when I was in London. I stayed with him out there. You know, he's a real, really lovely, genuine guy, and, and he's now he's in Pretty Maids. You know, <laughs> he's doing what he's always wanted to be doing. And, and he, he's a bit of a genius producer-wise, you know? Oh, yeah, yeah. I know a lot of people said his stuff was starting to sound samey, but he's just very... It, it, it's like he writes songs in his sleep, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, they just yeah. come out They come out of his pockets every single minute. But, um, yeah, I've got a lot of respect for, for both Anders and, and Chris, you know? And they're good, they, they turned into good friends of mine as well. Right, yeah, the first I... Oh, oh, he's killer. Yeah, yeah. You know, the first time I uh, uh, heard of Chris Laney is when he uh, worked on the first Crash Diet album. And, That's right. Yeah. And um, that was amazing, the production on that. You well, know. they actually, him and Dave Leppard actually wrote a song for me to go on, it was going to go on My Private Hell. But unfortunately, Dave died, as you know, you know. Right. It, it never came to fruition. It wasn't finished. So, yeah, but uh, yeah, the, the first Crash Diet album, in my opinion, is the best one. Right, yeah. 
Chris is, uh, he know, knows I'm like a, a diehard cra- Crash Diet fan. And, um, you know, when he went in the studio with, with Dave and stuff, Dave wrote uh, handwritten lyrics of a song called Needles. Yeah. Okay? And Chris knew how much, you know, I, I, I honored uh, Dave, and he sent me that uh, handwritten lyrics um, to me. Oh, nice. Yeah. You know, so, like, uh, that's hanging on my wall in honor of Dave and stuff like that. So let's get back to you again. Um, what are you going to do uh, coming up? Uh, yeah, so the solo record is uh, is in the works. Yeah, you know, starting to get everything together and start to get some song ideas together. Hopefully, I mean, I, I don't know how busy he's going to be, but I'd like to write a few more songs with Chris, obviously. Right. But uh, we'll see how that gut pans out because Pretty Maids are, are really really busy at the moment. So uh, and he's doing all that stuff. But yeah, that's what we're going to do. You know, we're going to do. It won't be my private hell part two, but it will obviously have elements of that in it, you know, because that's that's the way I was going. Now, will, will you, uh, you know, self finance and and put it out yourself, or are you going to look for a label? Uh, I've got um, I've got a label, AOR Boulevard Records over here. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Which yeah. is bizarre because they put my last record out, and it's it's anything but AOR, you know. But this one will be a bit more. It won't be AOR because I'm not, you know, I'm not. Uh, I don't sing for Giant or someone like that, you know. <laughs> Yeah, it'll have melodic parts in it, you know what I mean? Like my brother the hell did, you know? A lot of keyboards on that record anyway. So that, that's the way we're aiming for, yeah. Well, what's your relationship with uh, Kel Hel- Hellraiser? Oh, I've known Kel for, oh, I would imagine, the best part of 30 years, you know? He's, wow. been a, he's been a good friend of mine for a long, long time. And, you know, Kel knows his onions, man. He knows a lot, a lot of stuff about a lot of bands, and uh, he was a good writer when he was right. writing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yep. Yeah, I, I worked with him uh, with Metal Forces magazine, uh, you know, back oh, in the day. I know that. Yeah, yep. So um, that was yeah. good, Mac. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I liked it. I liked it a lot. Yeah. I had a lot of fun. Uh, I was doing the photography work, and uh, Dave Reynolds was doing my writer. So. Oh, Dave's Dave's a good friend as well. Dave's he's a great guy, you know. They don't get the respect they deserve. Those two, they really don't. Calvin and and, and uh, especially. You know, Dave, for all his work he did. Right, he did yes. the Steve notes for one of my records, Damned If I Do. Well, uh, Stevie, it's, uh, it was great talking to you, and uh, I enjoyed myself, uh, even though I feel like crap today. But yes. <laughs> Yeah, we should have left it. I was going to ask you how you felt. You know, I felt like shit, but, you know. Yeah. But, it's, not, you know, it's not good when you got to sit here talking to a screen either, is it? <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. so, uh, you know, congratulations on the album and, uh, yes. you know, congratulations on the upcoming album. And uh, Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll keep you in touch with that. I'll, I'll let you know what's going on with everything and, uh, you know, hopefully you'll like it. Did you did you like Time Machine? Or did yeah, you... I did. I listened to it a couple of times. I liked it a lot. Yeah, good. I mean, you Cherie know? Curry on there was, was great as well. That Gypsy Tramps and Thieves, I thought she'd done... A, sterling job on that you know right yeah wow wow would you like to say anything to the fans out there before we end yeah i'd like to say you know thanks for the thanks for all the support over the years and uh and and keep it up you know and hopefully I'll put, hopefully i'll put some new music out and they'll all like it again but uh, yeah keep the faith cool cool thanks a lot stevie all right mate we'll take care bye-bye cheers brian <laughs>